So today for Brown Art Network, the focus of our conversation will be surrounding classical music and its place in the modern world. Joining in on our conversation is Rizwan Jagani, who is an American vi violist of Indian and Pakistani heritage who classifies himself as a new fit musician. Um, his goal is to reimagine the idea of what the viola can do by combining his formal training in Western classical performance with other musical genres such as Bollywood, musical theater, pop rock, and much more. So hi Rizwan, welcome. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me. So before we dive into our central topic for today, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as well as your background as a musician? So back many, many years ago, when I was about to enter middle school, this was I went up around age 10. I, uh, the school I was entering in uh, Plano ISD, was we were all required to pick a fine arts elective, and that could be band, orchestra, or choir. I actually had a friend who was two years older than me who used to play the viola. And at that time I was like, oh, if he thinks it's cool, it must be cool. That's actually why I picked the instrument, not knowing what it sounded like or anything of the sort. I mean, everyone knew violin. I had never really heard of the viola unless until I had known what he had played. And I picked viola, hated it for like the first two years because then I discovered to my sadness that we don't always get the melody in the orchestra. And then uh, when I was in my third year of orchestra, I was in the top group at the school. Uh, my parents had bought me my first viola and I ended up liking it a lot more. I liked what we were playing. I liked the sound I could get out of the instrument. So then I realized I think this instrument was meant for me. Uh, you know, going through high school, uh, I was one of the few South Asians who continued it and I, because I just loved it so much. Um, and then entering undergrad, I was going to follow the dream of um, one of the many dreams of every South Asian, and that was to pursue a career in the medical field. And it wasn't so much that I was being coerced into it. I actually really enjoyed it. I actually, I was doing science fair. I was, and all of my projects were medical based. So I felt like I was poised to take that on as a career path. And I was still doing music, but after a year of being in pre-med, I dropped pre-med and I switched to engineering because I always was into aerospace and my father's an engineer, my mom's a doctor. So I was like, okay, if not one parental path to the other. Uh, <laughs> then a year and a half later, after a very rough time with vector calculus, I decided that math was probably not going to be good for me. I was still continuing viola at the time. I was actually minoring in music at my institution, Austin College in Sherman, Texas. And I had been doing quite well with viola. Uh, faculty had asked me to do, you know, on-campus performances for, you know, big public audiences. I had gotten into a statewide performance competition as the only violist. So I was thinking in the back of my head, it's like, why not do music? And even when I started pre-med, in the back of my head, I, the thought was always lingering. Am I going to regret not trying music as a career? So um, switch to music. <clears throat> Finished undergrad still in four years, uh, which was a miracle, but that sort of catapulted me uh, into other things. I took two years off in, um, after my undergrad to kind of soul search a little bit to see what I wanted to do with the art. Um, then I did my master's at Carnegie Mellon University. Then after that, I did what's called an artist diploma, which is a performance focused uh, program at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And I finished that over COVID. So I did part of it remote, part of it there. And now I'm doing my doctorate degree, which is called Doctorate of Musical Arts at Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. So this is where I am now. That's awesome. Cool. And, and I, I know you kind of mentioned, I feel like your your uh, career or your, your educational career so far has kind of been split between, split in two almost. What was that? Can you talk a little bit more about that transition from 
the engineering world to the music world? Like, were there any, like, what was kind of going on through your head? Was there anything that was kind of, that you were going back and forth on? Or or was it just an instant kind of decision? Like, oh, this is going to happen. I wasn't sure what was sort of going through my head at the time. You know, I had not done well in vector calculus and I knew that the math subjects would just get harder. Right. I was in a class called differential equations. We had our first quiz and I got a 10 out of a hundred. I, I feel that. I feel <laughs> like, that. And I was like, Oh no, this is just supposed to get harder and harder. And how am I going to handle this? And I, I, I didn't want, I wanted to just basically stay afloat in school at that point. Right. And so, um, and since music was sort of like the calling at the time, part of it was how are my parents going to react to it? And, you know, family and everything like that. So I had a lot of conversations with my mom and one of my cousins and my dad was in India at the time visiting his family. And my da- mom was like, you know, don't be hasty. Wait until your dad comes back from India and then you can make a more concrete decision. This was like week two or three into school. And I was just like, I can't wait. I, this is, I feel like where I need to go. So I uh, emailed my advisors and I tried to figure out how I could do it in the last year and a half. I was at the institution and I made the switch. I just felt like at that point at the time, it was the only way I could sort of stay afloat in school. I was like, you know what, let me at least finish undergrad and then figure out what I need to do with life. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, but the, that's a really cool way of getting into the viola. Like you kind of went full circle. You started in high school, didn't like it so much, but then you got to love it and then you got to do it more in college. Um, yeah. yeah. So you said, so like the new fit musician is a really cool term. I think that it really good describes like your talents. Um, aside from the viola, how did you get into like the uh, musical theater pop that you kind of currently do right now with your um, training? So originally when I was in high school, um, actually, when I was in middle school, um, this was actually my first exposure to the viola. Um, the conductor there, uh, Dennis Langevin, he would do these concerts for the incoming fifth graders that were about to come to the school. And the repertoire he would pick would be a combination of some classical stuff, but mostly pop stuff. So I remember hearing like uh, Pink Panther theme, <laughs> um, Mission Impossible. Oh. And so that was a very early exposure to pop music and, you know, non-classical. But I always knew that it was sort of reserved for special occasions. When I was in high school, um, and in Plano, it's 9, 10 is one school and 11, 12 is one, is one school. But the last concert of the year in both schools, both directors, um, Andrew Goins and Betsy Thomas, they, we would do a Pops concert. So we would do non-classical stuff. And uh, at the 9, 10 school, my conductor would do what was called the Mass Orchestra event. So this would be incoming ninth graders, uh, the, the current students at the school, and any alumni of that school that wanted to come down and participate in this big, huge string orchestra performance. And it often included electric, electric guitar, electric bass, drums, depending on what was going on, maybe another solo instrument. When I was an eighth grader coming into the school, we did We Will Rock You and We Are the Champions by uh, Queen. And so... For the We Will Rock You solo, uh, there was an electric cello solo. And then the whole orchestra would join in on We Will, We Will Rock You. And it was so cool because like, I was standing in the middle of this big wall of sound. And it was a very, very cool experience. And But again, it was one of those things where I realized, like, oh, is this only a special occasions type of thing? Eventually, I dived more into non-classical as a way of connecting with my family. Um, especially my family overseas, very few of my relatives were actually familiar with Western classical music. So the only way I could sort of play for them at family gatherings when you, I guess you are a musician, you become the default family entertainment. So it's always like, Rizwan, bring your viola with you. But it's like, what am I going to play? Uh, And that's how I started learning Bollywood, pop, rock. Musical theater for me is actually a personal favorite. Um, I got bitten by the theater bug when I was an undergrad. And afterwards, I discovered this huge genre of such beautifully written music. So it started first as a a way of connecting with family and then it became passion project after passion project and has become part of my identity. 
Cool. That's really cool. I I really appreciate. It. I think I think you're definitely drawn to music that has like kind of a blended quality to it. So you're mixing a lot of a lot of different genres and a lot of different themes, and you're kind of pulling them all together. Um, and and I I know we kind of threw out the word like new fit musician. Um, can you like kind of go into like where that originates from and like who kind of coined that term and like what how you kind of resonate with that? Sure. So this was back in early parts of 2020. I had uh, kind of been uprooted from Vegas and back, I was back in Texas because I'd come home for spring break and spring break never ended, essentially. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, was having a little bit of a hard time because I was trying to kind of get connected back in the scene in Dallas after not being there for some amount of time and trying to sort of navigate what I could bring as a musician to the entertainment scene there and also just get hired to play things because you know income and also just being able to perform that was what i was thirsting for was performing for people beyond just you know a live stream concert right and i was talking to one of my mentors uh her name is tatiana shamis and she currently sits principal viola of the pittsburgh symphony <laughs> orchestra and so she was one of my big mentors when i was at carnegie mellon and I was telling her, you know, I have a very hard time trying to fit in and reconcile with the fact that I do something different. In the classical world, people think that, oh, unless you're playing the greats like Brahms, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, those are what you should be adhering to. And in the South Asian world, you know, I'm not a singer. I I sing in the shower and I do karaoke. That's like the extent of my singing. (laughs) Um, Even though I'm trying to get better at it, but my voice is the viola. So unless you're which is unfamiliar to most South Asians. So at that point, I didn't fit in much there. And so I was telling her about that. She's like, create your own fit, new fit. And that's exactly what she sent me. And after that, I sort of reflect on it. And I think I need to start using that more because that is what I'm doing, essentially. Like, you know, I have, I'm trying to find my own voice and trying to empower it, even if it's not necessarily what's already given to me. I'm trying to create this new, this new idea, this new voice, and just lift it. And mm-hmm. so that's sort of where the idea of new fit came from. Gotcha. Yeah, it's kind of like a hybrid a situation. Like, you know how we always talk about hybrid of cultures. So it's like a mm-hmm. hybrid of music. That's, that's very cool. Um, I guess in line with the culture or topic of culture, um, how do you kind of blend your Western music training with your South Asian identity? Have you kind of felt like it's helped you grow more in your South Asian identity? Or like, how do you kind of reflect with that? So with my training, I always feel that, you know, that's sort of like the gold standard. And even a lot of singers who do different genres will tell you that their classical training, if they were trained classically, help them keep a long career because it taught them how to sing healthily. Mm -hmm. Same thing with my classical viola training. It's taught me how to have good technique, how to really think about having a sophisticated sound because that is one of my current goals, just to sound like a much more sophisticated musician and also how to play a lot more relaxed, be aware of what your body can do for you. So you're not fighting anything when you're playing the instrument. I, when I teach, I always tell my students that, you know, look at what your body does. This is the most natural way of holding the instrument, or this is the most natural way of playing the instrument. And it is exactly what your body is meant to do. So I use that training to sort of inform how I approach non-classical. So with the idea of good technique, a sophisticated sound, how to make musical sentences, already knowing what the ideas of the non-classical piece is, I apply that and I sort of bring the two together. Now, in the classical world, whenever I do solo performances, like if I have a recital or if I have something, the way I empower myself in a South Asian element is the attire. <clears throat> There's no hard, fast rule that you have to wear a tuxedo or you have to wear a dress pant and dress shirt if you're doing your own solo recital. I wear shalvar kameez, I wear Pakistani waistcoats, just because, first of all, they're comfortable. And second of all, they're beautiful pieces of clothing. And I definitely will say that I envy uh, women when they wear these long evening gowns because there is an elegance uh, factor to it. There's an individuality element and it's comfortable. Uh, Wearing a tuxedo when you have been practicing in a t-shirt for a very long time, 
it you un, you end up realizing oh i have like three more layers of clothing what is a viola what am i supposed to do <laughs> so, <laughs> so then i resort uh, so then i i wear a south asian um attire and it feels like i'm still wearing a t-shirt it's formal it's comfortable and it allows me to show with pride that hey i am a south asian and I'm a Western classically trained violist. And here I am ready to tell you my musical story through these pieces. That's really cool. And I, and I think I, that's definitely a good point that you bring like a, like, I think just the fact that you're trained in both sides or in Westernly class, Western class, classically trained. Wow. Words. Um, <laughs> and, and, and also showing that South Asian side is I think very important, especially to diversify that sort of, area or that that area of the music industry um kind of going off that a little bit when it comes to the new fit musician or the new fit music that you're you are making and producing who is your target who do you imagine your target audience for your music to be you know i always just hope that it's people who want to just listen to music you know people that i know who have seen my journey and you know want to be a part of it i always consider an artist's journey to be like a room that has a door that's always open. So I always say that, you know, the door is unlocked, it's open, come into the room and listen to the music. Um, But that doesn't always resonate with a lot of people and that's also fine. You know, everyone has their own musical taste. Um, Whenever I play musical theater pieces, I always try to target the musical theater fans because they're very adoring, they're almost cult-like. So if you play one of their favorite songs, (laughs) they will love you. Or I try to target the people uh, who I originally heard perform that work. And over the years, it's actually worked in my favor. Like I've actually made friends with different musical theater actors because they've seen my um, covers, if you will, many of whom actually went to Carnegie Mellon because Carnegie Mellon has a very good acting program. Mm. So a lot of actors I've seen on the big stage went to Carnegie Mellon. So if I meet them at like the stage door after a show, I tell them that, or if they've seen something of mine, I'll say like, Hey, I'm the viola guy who, you know, covered your song. And, you know, then they go crazy. Like I was actually talking to an actor uh, who played Simba and Lion King in London. And he was an actor I wanted to see for years, but he saw a video of mine. And when I met him, I told him, Hey, I'm the viola guy. And then he gave me a big hug. So, so, like, awesome. so that's somewhat my target audience if it's south asian of course i always think about my family they love my music and they've always been my biggest cheerleaders and then you know any south asian audience that you know wants to hear a reimagined version of maybe one of their favorite pieces but also people who like the culture but don't know the language as soon as you remove the language element and you just play the melody that everyone recognizes You have made the song universal. You have transcended the bridge of language and you have allowed other audiences to listen to something that either another group of people might like or you just want them to hear it. That's that's such an important factor that you bring up, like um, how you should like go go into something without having judgments. Um, Like you said, you just keep the door open and let people kind of come in and listen to your music. I think that's so important because like you said, language does... It's not a barrier in music and like you bring that really unique factor where you can remove that. So people who do maybe have reserves or judgments can actually maybe try to listen because I'm sure classical music, when someone says that like classical music or Western classical music, I'm sure a lot of people nowadays have like a tech, like a reserve in the back of their mind. Like, well, I really like it because I mean, I've heard, I've seen it in the movies and whatnot. So yeah. it's good that you, um, it, you like try to welcome people like, like warm them up, <laughs> like rather than be like, I'm a classical musician, come see me. Like, that's really good. Yeah, I, I kind of like, you know, and it is true. A lot of people do hear the term classical music. And unfortunately, pop culture has two ways of portraying it. They either incorporate it into their big scores for their movies or they make it the boring genre. And, you know, it's not always the case. Like last night I went to go see Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. And one of my favorite conductors was uh, leading the group. And one of my favorite soloists had come to do a performance. And it was spellbinding. It was such an amazing performance. And, you know, because I have that affinity for it, obviously I'm drawn to it. I can't say the same for everyone else. So, you know, obviously like you do it in little doses. Like, you know, you think about like a little kid, you know, you don't give them a viola, expect them to play like, you know, professional level literature. You teach them, you know, let's twinkle, twinkle, little star or something of that sort, bring them up to that. So similar, even with listeners, you know, 
you don't shock them with something intense you know you warm them up into it and it's like hey let's go to the concert together this piece i feel like you might like this piece like you know give them recommendations for something they can go listen to um easy listening and then maybe the more technical advanced stuff because even as a professional musician myself there are certain things that i will listen to and i'm just like this is weird right um (laughs) and and the good thing about classical music is a lot of it was written to be without words so that is instrumental storytelling at its finest but it also requires a lot on the listener to really immerse themselves in that world. If you have words, the story is already being told for you. When you're listening to something without words, you're kind of making your own story based on what you're listening to. Mm-hmm. Right. Actually, yeah. kind of going off that topic, because it just kind of popped into my head, but um, I, I, I was kind of curious on what your thoughts on, because you were saying how you have to ease people into um, liking classical music nowadays and it's kind of like an art that's kind of like it, it has a cult following or like it's it's almost like I, I hate to use the word underrated but it you know it's a, it's underrated and, and people don't tend to move in that direction anymore um do you do you think that has anything to do with the because I I follow film and like movies and like film politics and all that stuff and they you know in the movie world as well there's like an issue of like all these like movies are going unnoticed because there's just so much quote unquote content now. Do you think like the hyper saturation of like media has anything to do with that idea of like, you know, you have to like really like draw people in now. Like you have to really like be catchy and like, you know, like times are changing and and yeah. I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. You know, it's interesting because like if you go to a classical concert and you, and you look at your audience, you're gonna see a lot of people that are quite elderly mm-hmm. and you're gonna see some younger people 90% of the chance the younger people are music students, some of whom may even be studying with people in the orchestra. Um, that was a thing for me at Pittsburgh. You know, a lot of my colleagues and I, we would go to the concerts on Friday nights and then go to the stage door and meet our teachers. Um, it's interesting because classical music is basically, and like classical orchestras and musicians, we're basically like cover artists of the 18, 17, 1800s. You know, that's literature that's been tried and tested through time. And it, it, there is a reason. It's very beautifully written stuff by some of the greatest people to have ever lived. Um, but how do you sort of, deter, you know, deviate yourself from that is, you know, you have world premieres by, you know, different composers, you know, female composers, composers of color who are bringing their own elements into classical music. So... Um, last night, one of the, the, the concerto that was played, it was for solo violin and orchestra was written by a jazz and rhythm and blues trumpet player named Wynton Marsalis. And he's a Grammy award winning trumpet player. He wrote this piece for Nicola Benedetti, who was the soloist last night. And it has all the elements of blues and jazz and those sort of things. So it brings that ear of sound to an audience that may not be familiar with it. So that's one way to do it. But also, you don't always hear classical musicians having the spotlight unless you're in that world. Within the mainstream, it's always going to be a pop artist. So sometimes you have to look beyond the chatter and figure out, hey, is there something to listen to on this side of the musical spectrum? The answer is almost always yes. Right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's always just a matter of a little bit of effort. And that's where, like, you know, a little bit of guidance comes in. It's like, you know, if one person listens to a new piece, they tell their friends about it, they want to go listen to it. Or it's like, oh, have you heard this soloist? Oh, you need to go to an orchestra concert that has this conductor or something of that sort. And it's really just a matter of one thing leading to another, which I guess the pop world doesn't have to worry about because literally, like, if you're Beyonce, everyone knows when you release an album. Right. Yeah. And you got social media backing you up. So I'm sure exactly. in, in the pop media yeah. world. Yeah, exactly. Um, kind of diving back into um, your, uh, I guess your training. Um, I'm sure I know you talked about wearing your solar chemise when you perform and it gives you kind of like that um, sense of representation in your field. But I'm sure training or leading up to those types of like that moment must have been really different. So how did you kind of feel being the minority, I guess, in a, pre- a predominantly uh, white or Caucasian field? Um, and how did you kind of navigate being like those types of experiences? And you can also talk about the flip side of 
how it felt being South Asian, but being Westernly trained, classically trained. Sure. Um, you know, for the longest time, I was almost always the only, or like maybe one of two or three <clears throat> South Asians in the orchestra. Um, I remember my first year when I went to Austria to play um, in this festival. Uh, we had done Beethoven Nine, and which is one of my favorite pieces. And my parents had come up for the concert uh, uh, to Europe for it. And a lot of people just met my parents, and they were like, "We kind of know who who's uh, who you're supporting in the orchestra." And it was me because I was the only brown skin individual, you know, of South Asian heritage. So for the longest period of time, I always thought it was like a badge of honor that, you know, I, on this stage of all these different people, I mean, granted, predominantly white, and then some other, you know, there are other ethnic minorities too, but within the South Asian world, I felt like I was being this trailblazer. You know, I wasn't sticking to a conventional career path and I could, you know, represent that with pride that I was doing music at a high level and that, you know, I want to continue doing so and, you know, change as cliche as it sounds, changed the world around me with it because um, that was just how I felt at the time. But at the same time, I was often also wondering, are there others like me and where do I find them and, you know, become friends with them or like, you know, talk to them about their stories. And in the back of my head, I always thought that, you know, wait a minute, I had to fight a little bit to get here. How did, um, if there are other people out there, did they have my same struggle or were there, did they get more support in the get-go? So it's a two-way street in the sense. It's like, you know, we may not be properly represented on stage, but it's like there's more of a reason as to why. It's just I think cultural expectations hinder that sometimes, and I know we can talk about that a little bit later. And then on the flip side, being a South Asian who's classically trained and trying to mingle with other South Asian creatives, I feel like I have always encountered this issue where I hear people say that, oh, we need South Asian creatives. I put my foot forward and then I'm always told, you know, oh, but not like that. Mm -hmm. And then I look at what they're asking for or who they end up picking. It's almost always a singer, a traditional musician. So like, you know, maybe a tabla player, um, a writer, a comedian of something of that sort that they want to showcase. Even if I'm a classical musician playing Bollywood, because let's just be real, it is shown in Bollywood culture with, you know, Shah Rukh Khan playing in Mohabbate, which is a rant for a different day. But, <laughs> um, but when I think about that, it's like, hey, you've already idolized somebody in y'all's field who's doing something I'm doing. Why am I not getting the same opportunity to be on stage as, you know, another creative who shares the same background as I am? We are just two different people offering two different things but I feel like there's plenty of stage to go around. Mm -hmm. And I have encountered that struggle so many times. And that is where the new, uh, that is also partially where the new fit comes in. Because if I can't find my home there, I will make my own home. It's just that it, it gets irritating because when you are so pro have so much pride in your identity as a South Asian and you're not being welcomed by your own community, that's where things get a little upsetting. I don't care so much being the South Asian in the predominantly white world because nowadays there's always an idea of uniqueness that I can bring and people like that. You know, I play well, I work hard. In some cases, my skin color doesn't even matter. But in my own cultural home, it's kind of just like I want to feel welcome and I can't always feel welcome. I guess kind of going off that a little bit, I mean, and we kind of mentioned a little bit in the beginning, but um, when you did decide to pursue music, like classical music specifically, you know, you talked about your parents, but it was there anyone in that South Asian community that you speak of that had kind of a reaction to the idea of you switching over or the idea of you being Western classically trained as opposed to South Asian classically trained? Um, and, and can you talk a little bit about that and how you kind of navigated those conversations? Okay. Sure. So when it came to my, like, to kind of bounce off with my parents, when I switched my major, I didn't tell them I had done so. And th those right. were one of those cases where it was like, it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I told them after the fact, like when it was too late to switch back. And that was not good. But it was through my parents that I understood how, where they were coming from. 
they were more worried about the greater community because of what where they came from in their livelihoods. Uh, essentially, you know, my mom was a very pr- uh, prominent pediatrician in the Dallas area. And like, if we ever went to the mosque, like half of the kids there were her patients. Um, right. And so everyone would often ask my mom, like, you know, oh, are you sad that your child isn't going into medicine anymore? My dad did not have to deal with too much backlash. My mom, I think, did. And always that expression of lo kya ke henge, what will other people say, kept popping in to the into the conversation. And I always kept telling my parents this. It was like, are you so worried about what other people think, how their definition of success is? You know, what their definition of being brilliant is? It was more them. Every now and then, I would get a little bit of hard ice. Um, I actually had somebody at a at a wedding I had been hired to play at. Somebody had asked me, "Do you really get paid to play at events?" And I oh, man. and I kind of along the lines loosely retorted, saying, "Yeah, I'm sure you work for Cisco for free." <laughs> True. I mean, yeah, turn it around. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I'm always this about respecting your elders. That's like my big thing. But at the same time, elders, you have a responsibility of empowering your youth. Right. And you and you hear that conversation being tossed, whether it's in a religious community or a cultural community about empowering the youth for them to take the message forward. The same thing has, should be applying to mm-hmm. careers. Like, you know, as like a Muslim, as a South Asian, do we need more doctors that look like me? Do you, you know, why not be in the position where I can find someone in the younger generation that might be like me and be like, hey, I see you. You can do great things. It's a process. It's a journey. But if this is the journey you want to take, you need to take it. So, and it's always weird because it's either the older generation that, you know, is slightly closed minded and, you know, you're kind of fighting away at trying to open their eyes up to see the new perspectives. And every now and then I'll encounter people in my generation who still think that there's nothing more noble than being a physician. And I will agree, especially with what we've been going through in the last so many years. I mean, our physicians have become soldiers in a way, you know, trying to um, deal with everything in the pandemic. But at the same time, it's like, you know, there's other ways of helping people and we can all recognize that. Right. Um, and kind of going back to what you said, like everybody's that that notion of what it means to be successful is very different um, now that we are able to have a different opinion about it. And it's really interesting. I wanted to talk about what you said earlier about how like the South Asian community has like a certain they have a certain image when they think of South Asian creative. And sometimes they don't allow you to get opportunities because they think, oh, I need to have like this X, Y, Z when it comes to it being a South Asian creative. And I think that kind of plays into the fact of what you said, like they were grown, grown up with like a idea of what it means to be successful. And so they feel like my niche kind of fits that and it kind of goes to like, again, mainstream culture. I feel like the South Asian mainstream culture always propagates. This is what it means to be South Asian. And if you deter a little bit from that, it's just like, you have to fight so much harder to be like, I am South Asian. Don't tell me that I'm not, or like, don't yeah. tell me I'm not a creative. So okay. I just wanted to say that before when you talked about that, because I totally understand where you come from as well um, on that side. I, I feel I feel like that, sorry, not to cut you off. I feel like that also kind of stems from like this idea, like this competitiveness. I don't know where it stems. Like, I feel like it, we're all just kind of pitted against each other sometimes. And that, that idea of like what it means to be successful. We're all just like pinging off of each other all the time. And it's really hard to decipher yourself and pull yourself back. And as a, if, you're, if you're in the creative world as a South Asian, but also you're trying to distinct, to individualize yourself from that a little bit, it's hard to like separate and, and be like, no, I am Indian, but also like, please no, <laughs> like, give me some space. Like I am, I am my own person as well. Like we're, exactly. we're different people. So yeah, you, you brought up a very interesting point, actually, because when I moved here, I got some gigs. How did I get these gigs from other violists? Right. Um, and, you know, two of my viola friends here, they actually have their own podcast. And in one of the episodes, they said, who are we competing against? You know, when you go for an audition or when you're doing a performance, you're competing against yourself. 
Right. In South right. Asia. And, you know, so there's plenty of work to go around. Like, you know, if I can't take the job, let me pass it on to somebody who can. That's how I've gotten majority of my gigs here. And it's been wonderful because it made me feel like I was welcomed in the community and that, hey, I won't starve. You know, I still need to pick up a little bit more momentum in my gigs and my teaching, but that'll happen with time. There's often a running joke I have with some of my Desi friends. And we say that, you know, if someone's at the top of the ladder, the people at the bottom rather than use the same ladder to climb up or like, you know, if there's people at the top of the ladder, rather than help that person come up, they'll knock the ladder down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And I will never understand to this day why that's an issue. It's like there is plenty of space to be expressive. Quite frankly, I don't think we need to have 15 plus singers, uh, basically singers, you know, everyone has their own unique voice and, you know, different voices and different styles will resonate with everybody. That's fine. But, you know, if there is one different performer in the mix of things, that's never a bad thing. It, quite frankly, it's a better thing. Exactly. I think that kind of goes into play with like representation of South Asian media, like in media, because a lot of I feel like a lot of people have this idea of this is how a South Asian creative or person should look like in the media. But then we have these different types of people, like you said, like doing class, maybe Western classical music or doing different instruments. It kind of breaks that. So people are like, I don't know if we should represent that. Like, it's like being very selective now. And it's like, that's not fair. Like, we're not selective. Why are we being competitive when we could lift each other up? Like you said. So that's very true. Um, I, I had a, a little bit of a story. So back in 2017, um, and when I was still living in Dallas, this was right before I went to do my master's, I actually competed in like a local Mr. South Asia pageant. And, wow. and one of the rounds was a talent round. And the diversity of talents there was amazing. Like there was a painter, there was a cellist. Uh, so there was another classical musician. Uh, there were dancers. So, you know, everyone loves a Bollywood dance. At that point, when I saw dancers, I was like, oh, no, I'm, I'm dead. Uh, <laughs> and I think there was a singer. There was a singer, maybe. But I knew the dancers were the ones that scared me the most. Um, bec- because they're always hype. Yeah. <laughs> right. But so I, uh, I decided I was going to do Bollywood viola. And that was actually the primary reason I joined the pageant was I wanted to have a stage where I could do this and do it well. Mm-hmm. and you know but a good performance a welcoming a good audience and I guess the judges like what they saw I won the talent round for that and it made me feel good that hey I can actually compete against dancers mm-hmm. and in that case it also helps to know your audience like you know if you're playing for a predominantly South Asian crowd you might be a classically trained musician the instrument shows that you have that you know you're picking up that instrument and you're playing it by default, they know that you've had classical training or you've had a training of some sort. When you know your audience, it's okay. This is a South Asian audience. I have to play Bollywood. That's where the two come together and you have this beautiful performance. And it was one of those things where it made me realize like, hey, I can be on the same stage as a singer and as a dancer, but there needs to be more stages for that. Right. Yeah. The, the welcomeness. Yeah, Ex- Exactly. Yeah, um, I know we talked a little bit about um, the South Asian community is way of in, like welcoming or not welcoming the um, classical art. Um, I guess flip that a little bit. Do you think in terms of like class, uh, the Western classical, do you think the mixing of music genres or creating a fusion is kind of deemed unacceptable in this day and age? Or like, how do you feel? What do you think about like what they think of like f- a fusion of art? Um. I think it really depends on who you're talking to. You know, if you go to like a conservatory, like in the East Coast, there are a lot of, you know, classical music institutions that pride themselves on being strictly classical music, everything. And even new music written by modern composers specifically has to be the classical genre. So pitching an idea to them that, hey, I do a fusion may not get you the best reaction. I had actually auditioned for a school when I was doing my master's. And I asked one of the professors who was a Grammy award winning violist that was on faculty there. And I told him, I was like, you know, I do a little bit of mixing with cultures and I do a little bit of blending of styles. And I was like, is there space for me in this institution for me to continue doing so? 
And this was like a Q&A session after we had all done the auditions. And this was in front of like maybe 15 people. He literally told me, you may want to consider looking at a different school. Oh. And it was embarrassing because I was just like, wait a minute. You just shot down what I could bring to the school as a unique performer. But I guess uniqueness isn't welcome here. Mm-hmm. But then off record, like literally after the session had ended, I was talking to a few other people after it. And he said, I wish my students knew videography. I wish they knew video editing. I wish they knew audio editing. I wish they knew audio production. All of those skill sets I learned from non-classical. And because more often or not, there is a demand for that in, uh, in cultural creative realms. Like you'll always find the people that graduated from college that ended up becoming photographers and videographers and they do things for weddings. But the thing is you see the, you see what's in the front, but you don't look at what's in the back. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on who you're talking to. And even when I was auditioning for my master's, I mean, sorry, not my master's, my doctorate, I actually spoke to a teacher when I told her I do a lot of non-classical different blending of style sort of things. She said, I might not be able to help you, but I can pass you on to someone who can. And while I appreciate the honesty, wrong answer. Because if you really wanted to dedicate yourself to my ideas and help me bring them to life, the correct response would be, let me talk to my uh, colleagues and see who can come on board with us. And so, and the people who have these mentalities are a lot older than even some of the... Uh, other people within their same generation and some people just don't crack some people have a very you know face view about these things but if you I guess ease them into it the correct way they might be open to it and I encountered that a lot in my undergrad career I had a mentor who's probably like my my musical godfather who was very you know had a lot of chagrin um to me doing all the non-classical but I really just kept going with it and going with it. And then by the end, he was like, you have made this work. So it, it depends on who you're asking. And, you know, younger musicians around my age, like my teacher right now, she's uh, not that much older than I am in my doctorate. But when I told her about my ideas, she said, you know what? These are conversations that need to be had in going forward in our field. You have my support. Mm-hmm. So... There's a, there's a, I, but I think that the generation of, you know, rigidity in classical musician, I, classical music, I think that's sort of going away and more new ideas are coming because yes, I get that things have, uh, have stood the test of time, but people are constantly changing and people are constantly wanting to feel welcome to things. And if you tell somebody that, you know, I don't support your ideas, I'm sorry, you might not support their ideas, but you just made someone feel unwelcome to the table. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's really, I, I'm happy that at least there's like a kind of a positive spin on that. And I, I, it's, it's good that yeah. we, you are seeing like some movement in, in the right direction, at least in terms of like being accepted in that industry as like a mixed music genre. I also, I think that's a really good point that you bring where like, you know, pe- like in the creative field, like people always see the outcome, but they don't really see the backstage sort of work and the behind the scenes and like all the heart, like sweat and tears that go into all of the production elements of that. Um, yeah. And I think that's like a good kind of almost advice or tip for people who are wanting to go into that field, like, you know, put just as much energy into the editing and like the audio, like the behind the scenes stuff, because yeah. yes, you could be a great, you know, performer, but you know, it would probably, you know, if you want to be a more holistic sort of, you know, artist, then you're going to need to know all these little be- backstage stuff as well. Um, which yeah, I think there, Yeah. Sorry, no, what was no there's, there's always an emphasis in classical music about the journey and not the destination. Right. So like when you're preparing for a performance or preparing for an audition, the audition is kind of just like what you're working towards in a journey, which is within a longer journey. Right. But what you discover along that smaller journey takes you into the bigger one too. So depends on how you prepare for the audition. You know, are you taking lessons with other people? Are you putting in the time to inform yourself about the music that you're playing? All of that is behind the scenes because some people have even told me that, you know, um, 
I did not have the mental aptitude to do medicine because, and that's why I did music. Cause unfortunately people associated music a lot with illiteracy. And the thing is, it's just a different way of using the brain because you might, one person might be able to study the skeletal system and memorize everything, but can you learn a symphonic excerpt and audition for an orchestra with the same level of intensity in your preparation? And, you know, people say that, you know, oh, playing the instrument is easy. Even just playing the instrument all day <laughs> to the level it needs to look easy is it's a feat. It's a yes. full Olympic feat, honestly. We are yes. little muscle athletes, essentially. I, I was good. There, there is a lot of that. And I not a lot of that, but with certain people in our community where they really discredit the amount of work that goes into doing other careers as opposed to just, the, you know, what quote, quote unquote mainstream stuff. I think I think there needs to be like it kind of just like, hey, guys, like all other jobs do just as much work. Like it's not a competition. Exactly. Like we're all just dying inside. it, right. Like we're working <laughs> hard. We're working hard. <laughs> just, exactly. Just let let that be known. Exactly. Um, but but yeah no and and i was going to say kind of switching gears a little bit but do you think that like if people were to, were to stick cuz you you're a fan of like the the hybrid the john like uh bringing a bunch of different music all in once and like kind of create create opening that door for a, a variety of people and and you know all that stuff if, if people were to stick to purely classical music the traditional classical music do you think that the field has a potential to kind of die out? Like, do you think that the mixing of genres is almost kind of like a way to help, I don't want to say modernize, but like bring it to into the forefront of younger people's minds? Like, do you think that's going to help it in the future? You know, it's, there's like, there's two ways to look at it. If you want to stick strictly to classical, that's fine. But be imaginative with it. Like, you know, maybe do some sort of educational stuff with it. That way, you have people who are first-time symphony goers feel welcome. That way, it's just not the art form of the bourgeoisie, and it's only an elitist thing. That elitist mentality has to go away, first of all. Right. So you have to make people feel welcome. And even within, like, classical performance practice, I mentioned that I went to go see a violin concerto last night. And those are what I predominantly see when I go to see a concert, how many viola concertos have I seen or performed in, in my, in my time, maybe like four times, once in a professional, uh, once in a professional symphony, once I was playing in a regional symphony, I was in the orchestra and actually the teacher with whom I now study was the soloist. I've been a soloist, uh, with an orchestra. And then I played in this, in a similar orchestra and I played and as in the orchestra for a soloist who was doing the same piece that I did. And that was like maybe 2013, no, or 2010 to like now. That's more than a decade in which I've not even seen other viola concerti be performed. So I'm like, it's 2022, put viola concertos on your, on your season, attract more violists to your concerts. You know, make them feel seen too. And I'm not just saying that as a violist, it's just objectively speaking that, you know, we never see those sort of things pro programmed. And so you see the same stuff used, maybe sandwiched with some new things, but it's always the headliner is the true and tried tested piece that people seem to come back to. It's consumerism at its finest. But it's like, use that to your advantage. Bring people in for other things too. Um the blending of genres, like, you know, I, it's similar to what I, ba it's basically what I want to do my doctoral research in, where, you know, you don't have to advertise, you know, this is a pops performance, this is a classical performance, you kind of bring the worlds together. And I'm trying to use my instrument to do so, because it's underrepresented, unfortunately, but it's also the most versatile instrument. The viola is the closest to that of the human voice. And that is why if I do like a vocal piece on the viola, I can really tap into it and make it sound as though someone is singing. You just don't hear words. Mm -hmm. So you want to think of these ideas of how you can basically reimagine and bring new ideas forward and let people think that, hey, why not have like, you know, a Bollywood inspired performance next to a Beethoven symphony, you know? A lot of very famous pop singers 
have classical influence. Lady Gaga is one of them. She has classical influence, or even a lot of famous musical theater performers, they all have classical influence. So it's why not have the two worlds come together? Because, you know, there's enough for everybody. And also you will find that it's rare that you'll only find people liking one style of music. Why not have them go to an event where they can hear everything that they might like, or, you know, at least a few of the things that they might like? Because I don't see very many South Asians even attending classical concerts, let alone performing in them. I mean, I might be the token brown guy in the audience too, unless I, you know, bring my family with me or some friends with me. Um, so it's like, you know, if you have, for example, being South Asian, if you have, you know, a Bollywood inspired orchestral suite or, you know, a ver or a famous South or a South Asian performer whose name is on the program as like a soloist, that's how you bring more people in. That's how you allow, first of all, an audience that isn't familiar with the genre to become familiarized with it. And it allows the innovation to keep going by bringing in other cultures, by bringing in other ideas, by giving people the variety without marketing it as, you know, this is strictly classical or this is strictly pops. Why not have everything come together? Right. Yeah, yeah. You bring up a good point because I know the coin the term elitist is always like kind of seen with traditional music. Um, I, I I I do Bharatanatyam, so it's it's definitely seen in the Indian art, the like classical arts as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really good to see that like your emphasis on hybrids of cultures is removing that term because really music is not like any class level or socioeconomic status. So it's really good that you're take, breaking that stigma away from like the classical arts. So I think that's so important to have in order to have like Western or even Indian classical music to thrive in a society like today. So that's super important. You, you know, I think about, I think about a lot with like as, as a form of image with, you know, whether it's uh, Western classical, even, uh, you know, South, um, South Asian classical, um, like, you know, even like how you dress up for a concert in a, as you're attending. You know, personally, I hate wearing tuxedos because for me, it's always been a uniform since I was like 12, 13 years old, uh, to, uh, 14, 15 years old. Um, so I will never wear a tuxedo to a concert. I probably won't even wear one to a wedding because for me, it's a uniform. Um, but if there is somebody who wants to wear their favorite tuxedo to a classical concert, more power to you. If you know you want to, if you're let's say coming from a whole day out and about in the city, you're not going to wear a formal outfit all day. You might be in jeans and a sweater and like a, a you know an overcoat type thing. If that's what you're going to wear to the concert, so be it. You have two very different people at the same concert supporting the orchestra, supporting the arts. And rather than casting judgment on the younger person or who or whatever age they might be for wearing something different when this person's wearing a tuxedo, then you're going to push away more people. And right. that's the other issue with the elitism. It's like, you know, it's even just like with the idea of image. You know, I went to the concert last night in jeans and a turtleneck. Why? Because it was also cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean Maryland I mean this I mean I'm I'm from from Texas I'm not used to the weather here so I wanted to dress to look good and also stay warm and so you know there's a lot of different elements and it's like you know even t I've had this discussion with my mom it's like you know why not wear South Asian formal to attend a concert my mom is of the mentality that you know nothing is more formal than a western suit when mm -hmm. I feel as though our South Asian formal is just as formal, if not even more. Yeah. And so it's another way of wearing your South Asian pride in that sort of circle, even not as a performer, but even as an audience member that, you know, as an audience member, I'm different and I want to show it mm -hmm. that I love this style of music and I'm here to support it. Right. Yeah. I'm so glad we got to be able to talk about breaking down that elitist mindset since that's so yeah. important in this yeah. world. Um, I'm really glad we got to talk about that a little bit. But yeah, unfortunately, we have to wrap up the segment. I <laughs> wish you could continue on. I was like, looking at the time, like, oh, shoot, we should wrap this up. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess, so what do you, what can we kind of expect to see in like in your future um, in music as a violist? Um, and I guess... What do you kind of what can we kind of expect? And if you could also kind of just let us know some of the advice that you might have for 
upcoming musicians who are kind of similar to you and our, and our listeners that kind of want to build a career in like the tra- traditional world? That'd be great too. So for my personal journey, I'm here for at least the next uh, couple of years working on my doctorate. And, you know, I want to have that sort of academic seal and like the highest point I can get in my education in this, um, just for my sake. And also for my family's sake, my mom would always tell me like, you know, if you're going to do something, do it at its highest level. So I want to put my, that personal element to my doctorate. And so with that, I'll keep working on, you know, technique, I'll keep working on my classical literature. I'll also be bringing back some of my personal projects. I just finished my, I just did my first ever professional orchestra audition for the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. Congrats. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> oh and, you know, I didn't, I didn't make it to the finals, but I learned so much from that journey. Mm-hmm. And I kicked my tail as far as my technique is concerned. So I felt my musical growth go high, which segues into the advice that I want to give. It's always focus on your journey not your destination as cliche as that sounds it is true because you always want to be in a position where you're constantly growing as soon as you stop growing you decay right and additionally find your own individual voice you know if your individual voice tells you that you want to be in a symphony orchestra learn your excerpts and work your butt off and take your auditions but if you want to do something different with the viola or whatever instrument you play empower that voice don't let people come at you saying that this is not possible or you know we won't welcome you on our stage there's always a stage that will welcome you it's just a matter of finding it and making sure that you can keep the energy going so that way the naysayers don't jade you rather than that find an optimistic element that hey if these people won't welcome me there's always people that will welcome me and will welcome me with open arms with and, that, yeah. oh, did you have any other thoughts on that? I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but I will also just say that, you know, always achieve the highest excellence that you can achieve, which means like if you're working on an instrument or an art form, really good technique, really good artistry, really cultivate that. And that will take you far because you could be good at telling your story, but if your story is not written properly because the technique isn't good or if you know there's out of tune notes which is what i'm learning the hard way as well you know always make sure that your technique is at the best level you can make it awesome well thank you rizwan for coming onto the show to talk about your career as a new fit musician we are very excited to hear about your upcoming projects as well as you know if you finishing your career congrats on the concert or the the audition by the way that's amazing um for, for our listeners, if you're interested in seeing some of the music, check out his website in the episode description. We'll put that in there. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So before you kind of leave us today, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Revy Ray Audio. You might have heard that our intro and outro music is a little bit different this season and is definitely upgraded to a next level. That's all thanks to Revy Ray, who was our last guest in season two. and He agreed to help us out with our music for season three. So thank you so much, Revy Ray, for all your help. And if you guys want to get in contact with him to collaborate with any projects or work with Revy Ray Audio, we are linking his information to the episode description. So you can reach out to him or see all the other projects he's done. And thanks again, Revy, and we'll see you guys all in the next one.